This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. About 40 heads of state and governments who participated in the Mediterranean summit attended the military parade that was held to commemorate the French national holiday. The French press focused its attention on the participation of the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. Members of journalists without borders protested Assad's participation. More details with Hussein Fayyad Qantar from Paris. The Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, was sitting in the front row during the commemorations that were held for the French national holiday. Ironically, the French military band that participated in the celebration was named after the Lebanese national Antoine Dolodite, who was assassinated in 1983. At the time, Syria was blamed for the assassination. However, on Sunday, the Shans Lizay accused Iran of being behind the assassination, thus vindicating Damascus. The French press reminded Sarkozy of the Syrian responsibility for the assassination of the French ambassador in Beirut, Elwin Delamar, and the explosion of the headquarters of the French parachutists 25 years ago, which killed six people. 4,000 French soldiers, 60 planes, and dozens of helicopters participated in the military parade, which was attended by the heads of 40 states, who also participated in the Mediterranean summit on Sunday. The French press was focused on the participation of Bashar al-Assad. Journalists Without Borders tried to hold demonstrations against the presence of the Syrian president. However, the French security forces quickly arrested eight activists from the organization. It is very wrong to receive Assad in our national holiday, which commemorates freedom. We are celebrating the takeover of the Pastille prison in the presence of a man who imprisons all his opponents. Away from the press and activist protests, it seems that the French government is determined to open diplomatic channels with Syria in a way that serves the Lebanese, Israeli and French interests. Assad stands to gain a great deal. He now appears like a big mediator with Iran. If Assad can control Hezbollah and continue his indirect peace negotiations with Israel, then he will have the winning cards in his hand. France is in a unique position to play a central role in transforming the indirect negotiations between Syria and Israel into direct negotiations. Sources from the Elysee indicate that Sarkozy has received a green light regarding this issue during his latest visit to the Hebrew state. Whenever the French media talk about this military parade, it reminds the French about the man they call a controversial Syrian president. The media reported that the two winners of the Mediterranean summit and these national celebrations are Bashar al-Assad and Nicolas Sarkozy. Welcome to IBA News, coming to you from Jerusalem. Embattled Prime Minister Ehud Almert returns home from Paris late tonight, and just a few hours later, the cabinet is set to convene to ratify the prisoner exchange deal with Hezbollah. IBA's diplomatic correspondent Leah Zinder has that story. This morning, the prisoner service began transferring four of the Lebanese prisoners slated for release from the Ashmoret prison to the Hadarim facility, where terrorist Samir Kuntar, also part of the deal, is being held. The Lebanese newspaper Al Safir reports today that the prisoner exchange will begin at 9 a.m. at the Nakura crossing north of Roshanikra on Wednesday. German mediator Gerhard Conrad is expected to be present. 
The cabinet will be briefed tomorrow on the classified sections of the Hezbollah report on missing airman Ron Arad. Even though Hezbollah failed to provide any substantive information on Arad's fate, the cabinet is expected to ratify the prisoner exchange, including that of brutal terrorist Samir Kuntar. After the cabinet approves the deal and following a recommendation by the justice minister, President Shimon Peres will sign the pardon for Samir Kuntar, the most troubling and controversial aspect of the exchange agreement, but one the government has agreed to with gritted teeth. I think that is a good uh, deal in our point of view. We would like to see them uh, to come back to Israel. On the other hand, the price is very high, even though we need to pay this price because we supposed to take care about our uh, soldiers. In the first stage of the prisoner swap, the remains of some 200 slain Lebanese gunmen will be handed over, followed by Samir Kuntar and the other four. The two kidnapped IDF soldiers, Ehud Goldwasser and Eldad Regev, will be returned home. According to army intelligence, the two are no longer alive. Hezbollah is planning a mass rally for Wednesday afternoon when Hassan Nasrallah has said he will reveal new details of the operation in which Goldwasser and Regev were captured. This is a total failure and therefore I think most uh, citizens of Israel are expecting the Prime Minister, not just because of corruption but also because of this failure to step down. Two never-before-seen photographs of captured Israeli airman Ron Arad were handed over to Israel yesterday, along with personal letters and fragments of a diary. This is part of the prisoner exchange deal worked out with Hezbollah. IBA's Eli Walgalanter has more details. These are the two photographs of missing IAF airman Ron Arad, seen for the first time since his capture 22 years ago. They were handed over to Arad's wife, Tommy, late yesterday, together with three personal letters written by Arad and fragments of a diary. The material was part of an 80-page report by Hezbollah detailing what the group determined regarding the fate of the Israeli aviator who was shot down over Lebanon and captured alive in October 1986. The letters were addressed to Tommy and spoke of his love for her and their infant daughter Yuval. The letters and diary fragments were kept private, but the two photographs were released to the public. The Hezbollah report did not solve the mystery of Arad's fate. It was delivered as part of the first stage of a planned prisoner swap that includes the release of reservists Eldad Regev and Ehud Goldwasser, who were captured by Hezbollah two years and two days ago. The conclusion remains the same as a report delivered by Hezbollah in 2004, said defense officials. Arad went missing somewhere between the night of May 4, 1988 and the morning of May 5th and probably died. Officials from the Mossad, the Shin Bet Security Agency, and military intelligence met yesterday to review the 80-page Arabic language document that was forwarded to Israel on Saturday. They will brief the cabinet tomorrow morning on the report, after which the cabinet will vote again on the prisoner swap. A peace deal between Syria and Israel could become a reality in six months to two years if the two sides move from indirect talks to face-to-face -face meetings. That's the view of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, who is attending the Mediterranean summit in Paris. Hopes that Assad and Prime Minister Ehud Almert would shake hands were dashed again today as Assad ignored Almert as the two men stood just inches apart ahead of the Bastille Day parade. A Syrian official said at this stage Assad would not make any gesture of goodwill to the Israeli leader because Almert is a weak prime minister. And just to add salt to the wound, controversial Israeli Arab Knesset member Ahmed Tibi, who is not a member of the Israeli delegation, nevertheless said he and Assad shook hands at the Paris summit. Speaking on the sidelines of the Paris summit, Palestinian Authority Foreign Minister Riyad Maliki said he believes there is a new readiness on the part of Israelis to accommodate a more active European role in the peace process, something the Palestinians have been seeking for a long time. Maliki acknowledged that Prime Minister Omert's growing legal problems have weakened the Israeli leader, but he said for the moment the Palestinians have no other alternative. At the end of the day, you know, we have only one Israeli pres uh, Prime Minister today. His name is Hud uh, Olmert. Uh, until, you know, uh, uh, there will be another Israeli Prime Minister, we have to deal with that Israeli Prime Minister. And he, will, uh, he still has, you know, the mandate to uh, represent Israel and to negotiate on behalf of Israel. We expect, accept and, rec uh, and respect 
Israeli democracy, and as a result, you know, we are uh, dealing with uh, the current Israeli prime minister until there is a time, uh, and we'll have another uh, Israeli prime minister. There are important implications to the meeting between Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and the Lebanese President General Michel Suleiman in Paris. Our reporter in Beirut surveyed the echo from the meeting between the two presidents, which was aimed at strengthening the relations between the two neighboring countries. The Syrian-Lebanese relations will go back to normal, natural and historic, and not a matter that requires normalization. Lebanese President Michel Suleiman confirmed this after his meetings with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, who was the most prominent guest in the French capital. News of Assad's talks and meetings occupied the headlines of local and French newspapers. Political analysts and observers agreed that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's visit to Paris was historic due to its timing and results. Syria is the security valve for the area. Syrian leadership convinced the others of its central role in the region. What took place in Paris is just the beginning. Amidst the concentration of Arab and European presence, there were a few prominent figures, and Bashar al-Assad was at the forefront. His presence was important because it indicated that the attack against Syria in the past three or four years has fallen. According to observers, President Assad succeeded in releasing Syria from the isolation that has been imposed upon it. As such, it has now returned to the heart of the equation, with French commitment to move away from rhetoric and quickly implement the new relationship. In turn, this reflects on Syria's role in the various issues in the region, particularly in Lebanon. Lebanon and Syria are one country. The importance of the meeting is that it announced the failure of the group in Lebanon, which was allied to the United States. Those include the Arabs and non-Arabs who are betting on the demise of Syria. A new page has been turned in Lebanese-Syrian relations. The Syrian and Lebanese presidents announced the framework of the relationship, conveying it as a bilateral matter. The Lebanese people are satisfied with the affirmations by Presidents Suleiman and Assad. They hope that the coming days herald a new era, which will bring together those who were apart and reunite families in both countries. Sana Alawiye, Syrian TV, Beirut. The prisoner swap deal between Hezbollah and Israel is confirmed to take place the day after tomorrow, on Wednesday. The released Lebanese prisoners will arrive in the morning along with the dead bodies of about 200 Lebanese, Palestinian and Arab martyrs. The first station welcoming them will be al Nukura. After a two-hour celebration, the bodies will be transported by land in a large procession to Beirut. As for the five prisoners, they will travel from Nakura to Beirut by air, where they will be received by a number of prominent officials. A large festival will take place Wednesday evening in the southern suburbs, where Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, will give a speech. With the final authorization of the prisoner swap deal between Hezbollah and Israel under the auspices of the United Nations, the countdown has started. The date of the deal completion is fast approaching, which will likely take place this Wednesday. However, nothing official has been announced about the time the swap will begin, its stages, or how it will be completed.
القانون الإسرائيلي والمتمثلة بأعلام The Israeli government is awaiting to give its final authorization this Tuesday on the complete swap deal. The logistical preparations have commenced on both sides in preparation for the zero hour. This came after the first step of its kind in Israeli law, in which the Israel Prison Service announced the names of the five Lebanese prisoners to be released. They include the longest held prisoner, Samir al Qantar, along with Khudur Zaydan, Maher Qurani, Hamad al Shrur, and Hussein Suleiman. This is in addition to turning over the corpses of about 200 martyrs. The Israeli Prison Service is said to have transferred four Lebanese prisoners from Ashmoret prison in southern occupied Palestine to Hadarim prison in the area of Hasharon in preparation of their release. It was also reported that the Lebanese prisoners will undergo medical tests and will meet with representatives from the Red Cross. In turn, Hezbollah will release two Israeli prisoners, Eldad Rajiv and Ehud Goldwasser, and the body parts of a number of Israeli soldiers who died in the July offensive. Meanwhile, a number of sources talked about the completion of the exchange of two respective reports between Hezbollah and Israel via international mediation. The reports concern the fate of the Israeli Air Force navigator Ron Arad and the four Iranian diplomats who went missing in Lebanon. Meanwhile, preparations have commenced on the ground. According to information emanating from occupied Palestine, the occupation forces have almost completed digging 199 martyrs' graves and transporting their remains, paving the way to turn them over. The occupation army asked its forces to be alert, under the pretext of fearing surprises by Hezbollah. On the Lebanese side, preparations are underway for the large national wedding to welcome the prisoners. من مفاجآت حزب الله استمرت على الجانب اللبناني الاستعدادات للعرس الوطني الكبير حيث ذكرت معلومات The prisoners will be welcomed in three stages. First stop is Al-Naqura and the second at Beirut International Airport. The third and final stop is at a large political and civil parade in the southern suburbs where Secretary General Hezbollah will present a speech. يتحدث فيه الأمين العام لحزب الله السيد حسن نصر الله. Welcome to the program. Guilty of murdering his own people, Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir is being accused of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes in Darfur. The Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, or ICC, has filed an application to arrest the Sudanese leader. In his report, Luis Moreno Ocampo said that Omar al-Bashir bears criminal responsibility for atrocities committed over the past five years. If he's formally charged, Sudan's leader would be the world's first serving president to be indicted in this way. A panel of judges must not now decide whether there are reasonable grounds for an arrest warrant to be issued. In The Hague, the chief prosecutor spoke to my colleague, Stephen Cole, about why he's filed the application. Since March 2005, the Security Council requests not to investigate the cases in Darfur. With the first case, we started to investigate the case, we found evidence showing a minister of the government, Ahmed Haroun, as Minister for the Interior, coordinating the attacks against the village in 2002-2004. And we present the case against him, the minister, and a militia and Jewish leader called Ali Kushib. The other warrant were issued, and then we form, we're still investigating. The, the evidence we collect now, after the first case, show that after the remove people from the, from the village, they, they were into camps. In fact, the entire communities, Fur, Masalit, and Sagawa, were removed from their own land, and they are in the camps. But in the camps, they are attacking them. The attack is different. They are attacked through rapes. They rape old women, they rape girls, five years old, seven years old. They rape gang rapes in front of the parents. Any woman, any woman in the camps who has to go to look for fire good knows she could be raped. They are trying to do is they are going in groups of 20, so some of them escape. For them, it's a destiny of each day. So this is a genocide committed against those communities now living in camps. They are committing a genocide through rapes and hindering humanitarian assistance. They don't need gas chamber in the camps because they have the desert. So what they are doing is they remove them from the village into the desert 
they are not providing humanitarian assistance and they are hindering the international humanitarian assistance. So it's a much more sophisticated genocide, but it's a genocide. Well, the International Criminal Court, or ICC, began operating in 2002 as a permanent tribunal to prosecute individuals for genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. The ICC is only effective in 106 countries, those that have already signed an agreement to cooperate. The United States opposed its creation and Sudan has also refused to recognise the court, which will limit its impact in the country. Luis Moreno Ocampo was elected chief prosecutor for the ICC in 2003. It's his job to investigate when he believes that crimes have been or are being committed. Last year, he had two other senior Sudanese officials charged, but Sudan refused to hand them over. Just last month, the chief prosecutor said that Sudan's entire state apparatus had been involved in an organized campaign to attack civilians in Darfur. Well, joining our discussion today are our guests in cartoon Abdelrahman El Khalifa, lawyer and former general prosecutor in Sudan. In London, Sudan specialist and author Julie Flint, and also in London, Tawanda Hondora, deputy director of Amnesty International's Africa program. Thank you all for joining us. If I could go to you first, Tawanda Hondora, uh, what do you think the legal significance is of this move by the prosecutor? Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, the legal significance uh, of this application is that uh, this is the first time that a sitting head of state has actually, uh, well, stands the chance of being charged uh, with genocide, acts of genocide uh, by the ICC. It is important, especially with regards the issue of ensuring accountability for serious crimes were committed in Sudan and in Darfur and continue to be committed. So it is especially important towards ensuring that there is no impunity for serious crimes that are uh, committed in Darfur. Okay, Abdel Rahman Al Khalifa, what's your view on uh, on this move? Well, I think it's a very unfortunate one, and it is highly uh, political. Uh, it has very little to do with law, and uh, I don't trust the whole process. I think. Uh, the whole thing has been highly politicized, and, I, and, 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 and this, is, this has become, rather than a court of justice, this has become a tool for some of the major power for uh, manipulation. This is very unacceptable, and it is quite uh, unacceptable for lawyers. This is what against all the established rules of international law. It's against the rules of the uh, ICC itself. And, and, and I just wonder where uh, it will be heading to. Julie Flint, if I could bring you in. Uh, we heard the description of it as being a political move. Is that how you see it? No, not at all. I share the previous speaker's concern, but for very different reasons. Um, I was in Darfur at the beginning of 2004 and witnessed the war in the first storm years of 2003, 2004. And there's no doubt at all in my mind that um, war crimes, crimes against humani humanity were committed by this government, directed from the very top, from Khartoum. I am concerned, especially about the timing of this move. The international community is engaged in a, a democratic transition, an attempt to get a democratic transition out of dictatorship and mass murder with the government of Sudan. And I very much fear that indicting the president is not going to help us transit to democracy and peace. And if it's a question of justice against stability, I think the needs of the moment are in fact for stability and justice can perhaps wait until later. Arab League foreign ministers are meeting Saturday to discuss the International Criminal Court's move to file genocide charges against the Sudanese president. The African Union also says the ICC move will undermine peace efforts in Sudan. Here's more. In a move that has raised fears of violence in Darfur, ICC prosecutor Luis Moreno Campo has asked a three-judge panel to issue an arrest warrant for Sudan's president Omar al-Bashir. I just submit an application requesting to the Petra Chamber number three to issue an arrest warrant against Omar Hassan Ahmad al-Bashir. 
for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. This is the first time the Hague-based tribunal is indicting a sitting head of state. The ICC was set up in 2002 as the world's first permanent criminal court to take over from temporary tribunals. Serbia's former president Slobodan Milosevic and President Charles Taylor of Liberia were earlier indicted by other international courts. ICC judges now have to review the application by Prosecutor Ocampo. All these people in the Rome, under the Rome Statute, the prosecutor is not indicting individuals. I am requesting decision to the judges. As expected, Sudan reacted quickly and angrily to the charges. Sudan's vice president rejected the jurisdiction of the ICC and said genocide charges are politically motivated. Khartoum has promised to continue peace efforts and to protect the UN staff in Darfur. However, it says the move undermines peace efforts in the region. The Sudanese government does not consider this announcement and confirms its previous stance declared against the ICC. Since the ICC began to involve itself with Darfur issues, it has become more political exercise and not concerned with justice or law. ICC judges issued arrest warrants for two Sudanese suspects last year, but Khartoum refuses to hand them over. France and Britain have shown support for ICC's activities. Now Sudan looks set to seek support from China, Russia and the African countries of the United Nations to help block any arrest warrant. Well, in Turkey, prosecutors there have indicted 86 suspects on terrorism charges for their alleged involvement in plots to topple the Islamic-rooted government. More now for my correspondent, Jody Sabral. The long-awaited trial of Turkey's alleged coup plotters has now begun after almost 12 months of investigations. After months of speculation over motivations behind a string of arrests, including those of former generals, journalists and academics, Istanbul's chief prosecutor has finally delivered his indictment to an Istanbul court. The indictment charges 86 suspects. 48 are currently in custody. 38 are being tried without detention, some with the allegations of forming an armed terror organization, some being a member of a terror organization, and some helping a terror organization. The investigation began in June 2007, after an alleged criminal network that came to be known as Ergenecom was uncovered, when the police seized hand grenades, TNT explosives and fuses in a house in Istanbul. The definition of terror here should not be taken in a conventional sense as according to Article 1 of anti-terror law, which includes separatism. The suspects are charged with the crime of endangering the existence of the Turkish state and republic, weakening or destroying or seizing the authority of the state, eliminating fundamental rights and freedoms, or damaging the internal and external security of the state and public order. The indictment is said to number up to 2,500 pages and will be examined over the next two weeks by Istanbul's criminal court. The case is being viewed by liberals as a step towards strengthening Turkish democracy. The group is accused of plotting to overthrow the Islamic-rooted government. Uh, in Turkey, we had many military coups. We had at least four military coups, and there were several attempts for military coups. So all these coups or attempts just ended either with success, and they became successful, or they just died out, but nobody was questioned and nobody was put on trial. As part of this thorough investigation, a score of Turkish figures, including two senior retired generals, were jailed on July 1st. An additional indictment will be brought against these 21 people. Turkey's Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan has said that he believes the closure case is a result of his party's determination to continue with the probe into an alleged plot to overthrow his government. Jody Sabral, Press TV, Istanbul. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you.
Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.